want to thank Brown and Bill and all of the folks gathered here today for supporting this team and enabling this fantastic collaboration between three institutions, the Coast Guard, Coast Guard Academy, WWF, and Brown to move ahead. I think it's pro produced a really um, outstanding academic project that's going to have practical implications for the Coast Guard and WWF, and it's been a tremendous pleasure to have the opportunity to bring it together this year. Um, Katie Ardry, Sam Clarich, Chris Lagor, and Jerry Mc Jeremy McKenzie have been a joy to work with. They're a tremendous group. They've done outstanding work on this project. They've gone around the world, as they will tell you. Uh, they've had amazing experiences, and I think they have produced a report that is going to change the way government works, which is fantastic. It, you know, at the margins, but it's a tremendous contribution. I think I'm extremely proud of them. I uh, am honored to have been a part of it, and I think they should be very proud of themselves. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to them. Thank you, Bill and Becca. Good morning, Admiral Papp, Administrator Atwood, and distinguished guests. It is a pleasure to be presenting the research we've spent the last year working on. The Bering Strait is seeing an increase of traffic, which is increasing the risk of a maritime disaster. The goal of this presentation and its companion report is to address that risk through international cooperation and capability improvements. We'd also like to say thank you to our faculty from Brown for advising us on this project. It is also important to thank our clients, the United States Coast Guard Academy Center for Arctic Study and Policy, as well as the World Wildlife Fund. In particular, we would like to thank Dr. Becca Pincus of the Center for Arctic Study and Policy. Becca developed the proposal for this project and supported us throughout the project. Elena also provided invaluable support that included connecting us with key players in Russia. We could not have completed this report without both of their help. So thank you. Here's our agenda for today. We plan to quickly take you through a scenario that demonstrates risk in the region. We will then discuss the research questions that we started with before discussing our problem statement. After this, we will discuss our data and methods. We will then provide a brief context for the Bering Strait region. Finally, we will conclude the presentation presenting our findings and recommendations. Please hold your questions until the end. We had three primary research questions. First, how effectively are international and bilateral agreements governing maritime activity in the Bering Strait region being implemented at the street level by responsible agencies on either side of the border? Second, what is the anticipated time frame of increasing ship traffic and what pressure does that place on policymakers? And thirdly, are there any gaps in existing agreements that prevent effective bilateral collaboration? <coughs> now I'd like you to imagine a large ship carrying raw materials freshly extracted from the Arctic. It loses power. It's now adrift in the middle of the stormy Bering Strait. Luckily, a Coast Guard cutter is nearby with an embarked helicopter. Tugboats are sent to try and control the, the drift, but they are not strong enough. A line snaps and the decision is made to rescue the crew in abandoned ship. The vessel continues to drift towards shore, grounding and eventually breaking in two. Fuel begins to spill. This scenario is not unrealistic. The Selendang Ayu, which is shown in the video, did just this in the Aleutian Islands in 2004. The first Coast Guard helicopter that was sent to rescue the mariners ended up crashing after it was hit by a wave during the attempted rescue. A second helicopter was sent to complete the rescue. Ultimately, six crew members from the ship perished, 336,000 gallons of fuel spilled, resulting in the death of 1,600 seabirds, and it also left behind a lasting environmental impact. The risk of a Selendang U type incident or other maritime disaster occurring in the Bering Strait is increasing. Why? According to the U.S. Coast Guard Arctic strategy, the Arctic contains massive natural resource wealth to include an estimated 13% of the world's undiscovered oil reserves, an estimated 30% of the world's undiscovered natural gas reserves, and a trillion dollars worth of minerals. So the Arctic has extraordinary economic value. Meanwhile, the Arctic is undergoing massive environmental change. The red line on this 
image shows the peak ice in 1979 in the Arctic. The ice shown in the image is the peak ice in 2012. The ice coverage has declined an incredible 20% in that time period. Scientists agree that the Arctic will be ice-free in the summer by 2050. Therefore, climate change is leading to increased access to the Arctic's natural resources. The data gathered for this report confirms that traffic is increasing in the Arctic. Much of this traffic will impact the sole connection between the Arctic and Pacific Oceans, the 44 nautical mile wide Bering Strait. This combination of economic value and increased access is leading to increased traffic. The United States and Russia have strained bilateral relations, resulting from a combination of their Cold War history and concerns over each other's recent actions. The expansion of NATO to areas under Russia's traditional sphere of influence was seen as provocative. Likewise, Russia's transboundary interventions in Georgia, Syria, and the Ukraine are seen in a provocative light in the United States. This strained relationship between the U.S. and Russia has led to a lack of bilateral cooperation in the Bering Strait region. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, much of the U.S.'s Arctic waters were surveyed with imprecise technology. Some of the current charts actually use data from the 1800s. This means that outdated charts are an additional risk factor. The region currently suffers from a dearth of accurate weather modeling. This is because it was previously not needed. This problem has only been exacerbated by climate change, which has further destabilized the weather. So climate change is destabilizing the climate and making it harder to predict weather in the region. The U.S. Coast Guard must deal with the tyranny of distance in Alaska. In other words, response assets are all concentrated in the southern part of the state, which hinders the ability for the service to respond to a maritime disaster in the Bering Strait region. Thus, the region already suffers from a lack of response capability and infrastructure. So what does all of this mean? The risk of a maritime disaster is increasing. The primary risk in the region is of a ship grounding. Additional risk include the possibility of a ship collision as traffic increases. Finally, there is the risk of maritime terrorism leading to an ecological disaster. To recap, the value of the Arctic's natural resources coupled with climate change are leading to increased traffic in the Bering Strait. The risk of increased traffic is compounded by four factors. First, there is a lack of bilateral cooperation. Second, the region's charts are outdated. Third, the destabilized climate and poor weather modeling. Sorry. And fourth, there is a lack of response capability and infrastructure. All of this points to the increased risk of a maritime disaster and the Bering Strait. <coughs> We started our research with an extensive literature review that included peer-reviewed publications, the popular media, and government reports. We also reanalyzed the Arctic Council's Accident Incident Database, embarked upon field research, and conducted 52 interviews. We will cover each of these in more detail in the coming slides. We used the Bering Sea in the Accident Incident Database as a proxy to determine risk in the Bering Strait. We acknowledge that this is an imperfect proxy, but it is the only data available to make such a prediction. The Bering Sea is also a shared sea with the U.S. and Russia. Therefore, any trends noted in the Bering Sea region could also be attributed to the level of cooperation in the region. As the ice recedes, trends noted in the Bering Sea will likely travel north to the Bering Strait. The accident incident database showed that over 33% of the marine accidents in the Arctic from 1995 to 2004 happened in the Bering Sea. This is original analysis from our research, and it's the tall line. Additional findings from the Accident Incident Database include the fact that 47% of marine, Arctic marine oil spills occurred in the Bering. That's almost half. The data also demonstrate at the 95% confidence level that more fuel was spilled in those accidents than in other Arctic accidents. Finally, 57% of Arctic marine accidents that involved a fatality during this period happened in the Bering Sea. The 
The team also conducted field research traveling around the world on dog sled. <laughs> Just kidding, we only did that in Alaska. The entire team did travel to Anchorage, Alaska, as well as the United States Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut. Katie and I traveled to New York City to meet with WWF. And finally, Sam and I traveled to Washington, Moscow, and St. Petersburg to conduct additional research. As you can see by the pictures, we really did go all over the world. <laughs> it was a fantastic time to travel to Alaska. There's nothing better than Alaska in December and Moscow in February. <laughs> The most important data source for the research is the 52 original interviews that we conducted. 37 of these interviews were conducted in the United States. This pie chart shows the number of interviews conducted in each category in the US. Three of the interviews are counted in two categories, which meant a person actually fit in the two categories. Interviews in both the US and Russia were off the record and were conducted using a snowball sampling method. The interviews were off the record in order to get the most honest assessment of the interviewees. This pie chart shows the breakdown for the 15 interviews we conducted in Russia. WWF was essential for this, I want to point out as well, and they were the ones that coordinated a lot of this. So. It is a pleasure to introduce Sam to take you through some background in the Bering Strait region. Thank you, Jeremy. Hello, everyone. Alaska is a very large state. This overlay from PBS News shows a size comparison of Alaska versus the lower 48 states. As you can see, Alaska is huge. Alaska has over 6,600 miles of coastline, which is protected by one U.S. Coast Guard district, two sectors, and two air stations all of which are concentrated in southern Alaska, as shown by the gold stars. The west coast of the U.S., however, is over 1,200 miles long, and it is protected by two U.S. Coast Guard districts, seven U.S. Coast Guard sectors, and eight air stations. The red stars all show the U.S. Coast Guard air stations in the lower 48 in order to provide a comparison with Alaska. The United States Coast Guard recognizes the increasing risk in the region, and it has initiated a port access route study as a result, or PARS. PARS would recommend a voluntary route structure to reduce the risk of a maritime disaster in the region. However, Russian and Alaskan interviewees do not support, support PARS as it is currently written. Russian experts noted that PARS is not flexible enough for bad weather conditions, and they don't believe traffic is dense enough at this time to warrant this type of structure. While many agree that some type of structure is needed, the majority of interviewees uh, agreed that PARS is not the answer to the concerns facing the Bering Strait at this time. There are three major shipping routes that all converge on the Bering Strait. Much of the press in the popular media is focused on the economic viability of container shipping along these routes. We will talk more about this in our findings and recommendations, but for now, it is important to introduce you to where these routes are. The first route of concern is the Northwest Passage, as indicated by the green line on the left part of the map. The second route of concern is the Transarctic Route, which is the blue line down the center. And the third and most important route for the purpose of this study is the Northern Sea Route, which is the red line on the right side of the map. Alaska is a unique state compared to the lower 48. It has a small population that is spread across a huge landmass. Because of this, it has a unique political climate that is often split on many of our major issues. The majority of Alaskans were for an increased U.S. Coast Guard presence and for smart risk reduction measures that would not impact economic development in the region. The indigenous peoples of Alaska make up about 11 percent of the population. The people of the Bering Strait region are subsistence hunters. However, the increase in traffic coupled with receding sea ice as negatively impacting many of those subsistence hunters. Most indigenous peoples we interviewed were also for an increased U.S. Coast Guard presence in order to reduce risk. However, there were differences on the details of how to implement uh, such ri risk reduction measures. All agree that traditional knowledge should be incorporated into any policy that might impact the region. 
we will now turn to a basic legal framework that currently governs the Arctic. Bear with me on this one. The Bering Strait is an international strait under UNCLOS, or the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Thus, all ships have the right of transit passage, and bordering states cannot act unilaterally to impose regulations. The United States has not ratified UNCLOS, but it does treat it as customary international law. Additionally, the United States has signed the Alilisat Declaration, in which the Arctic states declare their commitment to a legal framework, including UNCLOS. Other agreements include a 1989 agreement, which established best practices for the US and Russia in responding to pollution, and it called on those countries to develop a joint contingency plan. The 2011 agreement established best practices for the Arctic states in event of a search and rescue operation. The 2011 U.S. and Russian joint statement on cooperation in the Bering Strait region, in which the two parties agreed to work together in the region. The 2013 agreement called on the countries to develop points of contact to pre-position oil spill response equipment in order to act in coordination. And finally, the 2015 Arctic Coast Guard Forum Agreement said that there would be regular contact, meetings, and exercises between the Arctic nations. Numerous interviewees in both Russia and the U.S. noted that the agreements provide an excellent foundation. However, work is needed in order to operationalize those agreements. As noted earlier, the Bering Strait is an international strait under UNCLOS, and the U.S. and Russia are jointly responsible for its protection. The last functional oil spill response exercise between the U.S. and Russia was 18 years ago. The last meeting between the U.S. and Russia was in Vladivostok in 2013, nearly three years ago. Historically, the Russia, Russia and the U.S. have cooperated in the Arctic, even during periods of high political tension, to include the passage of the 1973 Agreement on the Conservation of Polar Bears. They have also worked well together on the Arctic Council. However, now there is little to no cooperation between, this two state, between the two states because of those current tensions that I mentioned earlier. These tensions have effectively prohibited cooperation in the Bering Strait region, yet the need for cooperation has never been, has never been greater uh, because of this increased risk. U.S. and Russian Arctic strategies each have broadly three goals. The first is to advance their own national interests. The second is to protect the environment. And the third is to enhance and preserve international cooperation in the region. The U.S. Th there is potential for agreement given the alignment of the environmental and international cooperation goals. However, there are, in there are interests that are divergent, and this includes national security interests. Given our research and, and, uh, and the data that we've observed, it is our assessment that the media overblows the perception of military threat by the Russian government in the Arctic. Although Russia's Arctic moves can be seen through a variety of lenses, it is our assessment that Russia's primary motivations in the Arctic are based on economic interests. Russia also requires foreign technical assistance in order to develop its Arctic region. Therefore, it is in Russia's own interest not to destabilize the region through belligerent actions. As previously mentioned, the Arctic's climate is becoming destabilized. This figure illustrates this point. And the Arctic temperature has warmed since 1976, which has resulted in decreased sea ice coverage which has allowed for increased marine accessibility to the region. Many scientists predict that this temperature trend will continue and that the average annual temperature will also continue to rise. Most forecasting models in the Arctic predict that it will be ice-free by the year of 20, 2050, during the summer. And this will lead to a dramatic increase in marine accessibility. <coughs> it's my pleasure now to introduce my friend and partner, Katie Ardry, to present our findings and recommendations. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. I will first be starting by talking about our findings. The U.S. Committee on the Marine Transporta Transportation System, or CMTS, published a 10-year projection of maritime activity in the U.S. Arctic region in 2015. This study predicts a significant increase in traffic and transit activity in the Bering Strait region. On the left, this graph shows the low, medium, and high predictions without container shipping. The right side shows these predictions with container shipping. The CMTS predicts there will be an increase from 540 vessel transits in 2015 
to a maximum of 2,637 vessel transits in 2025. All of this traffic will be concentrated during the ice-free periods of the summer months. Russia is developing liquefied natural gas, or LNG, sites on both the Yamal and Gidyan Peninsula. These sites will ship their product east along the northern sea route during ice-free periods. Once both these facilities are online in 2017, we're looking at an increase of one ship per day through the Bering Strait. So the data confirms that destinational traffic is going to increase. Officials in Russia all noted the importance of resource extraction for their economy. Ecotourism is also going to increase. This summer, the Crystal Serenity will be taking 1,700 passengers and crew through the Bering Strait on their way to the Northwest Passage. This voyage is already sold out, and U.S. officials can confirm that Crystal Cruise Lines is planning another voyage for next summer. Container shipping is one of the most frequently discussed items in the popular media when talking about the Arctic. However, we do not believe that there will be an increase in container, Arctic container shipping in the near future. This is because right now, Arctic shipping just cannot match the low cost of traditional shipping routes due to ship size limitations on these Arctic sea routes. So, we expect an increase in destinational and ecotourism related traffic while we do not expect an increase in container shipping right now. All interviewees agree on the following four points. First, both Russian and U.S. interviewees agree, <clears throat> agree that it would benefit both the United States and Russia for, to resume joint exercises. For instance, it has been 18 years since the last oil spill response exercise. Interviewees recommend to decouple the Arctic from other aspects of their bilateral relationship, much like the International Space Station. Neither the U.S. nor Russia have the capabilities to go it alone in the region. Second, current agreements are an important starting point, but they need to be operationalized. In other words, that means that the two sides need to learn to work together to prevent and respond to disasters. Third, Communications and information sharing are critical to gain efficiencies and reduce risk. Information sharing should include science, charting, weather forecasting, shipping data, and wildlife migration patterns. Finally, all interviewees agreed that a system is needed to manage traffic in the Bering Strait region. The problem comes when you try to find an agreement on what that system should look like. We were able to find a clear majority is interested in exploring dynamic areas to be avoided, or ATBAs, which create temporary restricted areas based on real-time information. ATBAs can protect industry, wildlife, indige indigenous peoples, and scientific activities. Our recommendations are arranged by bilateral recommendations for the United States and Russia, and unilateral recommendations for the United States. First, we recommend, and the data supports, the following six bilateral recommendations. The United States and Russia should consider officer exchanges between the United States Coast Guard and either the Russian Coast Guard or Maritime Rescue Service. The U.S. already does this with Canada, the U.K., and many other countries. Second, they should renew joint exercises with the focus on both oil spill response and search and rescue. Third, dynamic areas to be avoided, or ATBAs, should be implemented in conjunction with speed restrictions. Fourth, the United States and Russia should resume Arctic marine shipping data <coughs> assessment data collection and start collection of an indigenous knowledge database. <coughs> Fifth, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum and Arctic Council should be strengthened. This could be done by creating a permanent secretariat and staff. Finally, a Maritime Domain Awareness Center, or MDAC, should be established to manage the region. We recommend, and the data supports, the following seven unilateral recommendations. First, the Arctic should be decoupled from other aspects of the Russia-U.S. bilateral relationship. <clears throat> Second, 
All the Russian interviewees noted that the Russian system is different from the U.S. system of government. Each of them noted that the success of any bilateral action will require high-level approval from either the presidential or ministerial level in the Russian system. Additionally, each of these <clears throat> interviewees noted that the U.S. does not currently speak to the appropriate agencies within the Russian government. So we recommend the United States should review their partners for bilateral action in the region. Third, the United States Coast Guard needs to look at the possibility of pursuing the acquisition and operation of heavy tugs in Alaska. The Coast Guard should conduct a study to determine capability and basing requirements. Fourth, the U.S. should increase United States Coast Guard in the Bering Strait. Fifth, the United States should increase communications and automatic identification system, or AIS, infrastructure in the region. Sixth, additional funding should be provided in order to update nautical charts. Finally, the United States should ratify the United, <clears throat> United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, as it will increase stability in the region. We recommend the United States and Russia discuss the following package of three steps at the Arctic Coast Guard Forum meeting in Boston in June. First, the United States and Russia should decouple their bilateral relationship in the Arctic from other aspects of their relationship. Second, the United States and Russia should resume bilateral exercises with the goal of an annual exercise that alternates between communications and functional exercises. These should focus on oil spill response and search and rescue. Third, and finally, the U.S. and Russia should build a Maritime Domain Awareness Center, or MDAC, that will be responsible for implementing Dynamic Areas to be Avoided, or ATBAs, and speed restrictions to reduce risk. The data indicate that these three steps will be the most effective initial risk reduction strategy. In conclusion, now, is, now it is time to act to reduce risk in the Bering Strait region. As one senior staffer for a U.S. Senator said, we are not going to keep getting lucky. Thank you for attending our presentation, and thank you again to Becca, Elena, and Brown University for their incredible support. We really couldn't have done this without you. We'd be happy to field any questions you might have at this time. Thank you. Terry. Excuse me. Um, so this is great. Congratulations. Um, and uh, so I do have some questions. And um, I guess the first first question I have uh, would be: uh, You described um, the Native Americans that you uh, Native indigenous, indigenous people. Indigenous people. Excuse me. All right. Um, and uh, and you and you made a point of saying that it was important to have that input. And I just wondered if you could describe, you know, give some examples of, of what you mean and what distinguishes it from the input of others. Absolutely. So uh, we mentioned as one of our recommendations that there should be an indigenous knowledge database. And that database would be a collection of knowledge that's not written down currently and not accessible to the public. And that type of knowledge would be um, on recent climate change. They are probably the best on the ground source of knowledge for where the ice has receded, uh, where wildlife migration patterns have changed because of the receding ice. And they actually are able to do their own search and rescue response, as we've seen in a few examples, uh, where they've actually tried to assist the United States Coast Guard on these response efforts. Um, so they have a, their own wealth of knowledge that's not really being used in any way right now and, and should be. I hope that yeah, answers the question. Yeah. And there was also a, a recent article in Alaska Dispatch News that talked about PARS. And uh, one perspective of, of PARS is there was a large meeting, think about a room like this, that was filled with people. And the woman looked around the room and she saw only two other indigenous people there. Um, and she was concerned that that these two people that were there weren't even from the communities that were going to be impacted by PARS. 
Um, so one of the things that has been is very sensitive in Alaska is that you have to have indigenous involvement. So and that's one perspective that was put in the popular media. But if it's out, you know, sometimes perception is reality. So. Mm -hmm. Bering Straits has a great deal of mineral wealth. Um, one of the reasons that the Law of the Sea Treaty wasn't ratified initially was because of the restrictions on mining in international waters. But those, <coughs> there have, those restrictions have been changed. The, the treaty itself has been modified to accommodate. It seems to me, given your presentation, but given generally the concerns about the Arctic area, in the Arctic Council that uh, there's a strong case to be made now, especially since the Law of the Sea has been modified. Uh, tell me a little bit about your recommendation that it be ratified and what, what, what if it isn't ratified, what constraints does that uh, cause when you're looking at cooperation in the very place? When, we, when Sam and I were in Russia, and Sam, please jump in on this. But uh, when we were in Russia and we, and we spoke to the academics and the officials in Russia, we asked the UNCLOS question. And we asked the UNCLOS question to all 52 of the interviewees. And I, and I can say that every single, the every single one of the interviewees, both in the US and Russia, said that the US should ratify UNCLOS. Um, one of the Russian academics carefully threaded the needle, saying that I think that if I say that you should ratify it, it's just one more reason that your Senate will not ratify it. <laughs> no, knowing, the, knowing, knowing the politics of the situation, but he's, he's correct. But I think what we've seen with the research is we've happened to come across um, some communications be between the uh, Department of State and the Moscow Embassy and then from the Foreign Ministry to responding to the Embassy about U.S. concerns over Russian actions in the Northern Sea Route. And one of the responses from the, or the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs was basically that if you're not a signatory state, you can't question the actions of another signatory state's actions underneath the convention. So it hurts our ability to even have a discussion of the issues because basically right now it's, it can be used, they can roll the treaty up and poke our eyes with it, um, which is not, it's not helpful. So, but and it, the other point that was noted by all the academics is it doesn't increase stability because even though we treat UNCLOS as customary international law in the United States, customer inter Customary international law doesn't have the same force as something that's actual written international law, accepted, ratified treaty. Um, so there's less stability and there's more questions about well, what happens if there is a political change in the United States with an election coming up. Um, so, so that stability is something that would help our negotiating stance, not only in the Arctic, but globally. Guys, it was a great job. And, um, <clears throat> at the end of the day, I'm taking the, the issue of risk management and risk mitigation is really pretty key. And I'm wondering whether it's possible to think about quantifying any of those issues. So, so what's the cost benefit of acting versus not acting? And is there a compelling case that we can make that to continue to do nothing, or as Kate said, hope to get lucky, is a bad plan? There definitely is a there's cost. There's a cost involved with what we recommended. I didn't, I didn't add it all up, but now I'm starting to think, okay, we've got to look at one. So I think we did it all, but should there be a piece of Can you pull up the, what's the, the, the initial reduction package? Mm -hmm. some, some of the things there is a lot of cost to, um, but not as much as you may think. For instance, if you look at the initial package that we recommend, decoupling the Arctic from bilateral relations, it's relatively cost free. It's it's a decision that needs to be made that we're gonna we're not gonna <coughs> link everything together. The Arctic's gonna be separate, just like the International Space Station separate. Resuming bilateral exercises, there's a small cost to that, but that's relatively cheap. Um, th th to know who you're gonna call on the other side if there's an accident is a lot cheaper than having no idea who you're gonna call and having a delayed response. Um, and and that's a relatively I, I would you could probably run exercises for less than a, well less than a million dollars. I mean, so we're, we're talking about change in, in, in the federal government's budget. The 
MDAC piece is probably the most expensive piece, and you could talk about that being expensive, but can you go to the backup MDAC slide? Mm -hmm. So Maritime Domain Awareness Center, you can talk about it being a little bit more expensive. Um, but we actually spoke to Ed Page, and I, I can use his name on this because he did say we could talk about him on this. Um, and he's a part of the network. He's on the board of the network. And the network is this nonprofit that runs basically a maritime domain awareness center on a pay-for-fee service type or pay-for-service pay model. So ships pay into this network. The network monitors where they're at. It has communications coverage. It has some response capability. But it only provides coverage in the area that's in green. So this, this round spot here. The easiest solution for this, and probably the most politically palatable one, given the difficult bilateral relations, is for Russia and the U.S. to work with the network to expand its coverage to the international waters right there, as well as Russian waters, and expand this and have that nonprofit act as the center for us. And it's relatively cheap, according to Ed. It's not an expensive option, because most of the infrastructure is in place. You just have to expand where you're looking. Um, and it's also, you, you do away with a lot of the security concerns and a lot of who's going to be in charge of the center. Well, it's a nonprofit. It doesn't matter. So there's a lot, of, a lot of the competition pieces go away. So I think if you look at our initial package, this is not an expensive package. Now, there are other, uh, there are other pieces that if you go to operate tugs and whatever else, those are going to be a much more expensive package. But that's where we said that you need to have a study conducted to look at where mm -hmm. the highest risk is to make sure that that makes sense in those areas. And if Oh, you go ahead first. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just a quick comment. A lot of these things will be incremental as well. So a lot, what we would like to do and to accomplish is to have an initial first step that perhaps we could do in the Coast Guard form uh, next month. So if we can get these conversations going, that we can resume communications, which can then resume, uh, go into joint exercises, which we haven't done in quite some time, then from there we can build, and then at, at some point we can establish more uh, air stations or sectors um, throughout the Alaskan coastline. So this is very incremental, and we, we, we understand that this can't be uh, yeah, an overnight process. So. But I think at the end of the day, the most important point is we're doing this to reduce risk because an accident in the bearing could be catastrophic for the environment, the people there. And as Jeremy said in, in the story at the beginning, uh, loss of life is is very realistic if something was to happen. So it's putting a number on the environment and damage to that and putting a number on losing human life that you need to keep into perspective as to the cost uh, benefit analysis that should be done for that. If I could just add some more context uh, from an economic standpoint, um, the Strait of Malacca is, a, is another international strait um, and there there's uh, also some contentious, uh, some contentious points between the 11 states that that are uh, on the Strait of Malacca. So uh, they've met, they've uh, created what's called a command and control coordination center. Uh, they've been able to mitigate uh, piracy, which was really uh, a really a really big challenge for them by sharing information and having the same op operational picture using similar systems as AIS and what the network uh, would do for the Bering Strait. And there was also one point um, that I want to add to this as well. Uh, one of the senior U.S. officials brought up the point, how much was it to move a village of 40 people? Uh, 30 oh. million. I think it was 30 million, 40 million to move a village of 30 or 40 people. Um, so think about if you have a major disaster and all of a sudden this subsistence community can no longer subsistence hunt, what's it going to cost to move that community? And then finally, I think, <laughs> sorry, yep. to hammer home this, this, this question. Uh, then you have another compar uh, comparison that, you know, which was Exxon Valdez. It cost about $600 per gallon to clean up. And that was in an area that is relatively well structured to respond to that type of incident. And if you were to look at a comparison, if something is equal or even lesser value that were to happen up near the Bering Strait, then it could just be uh, really catastrophic was the word that was used. Other questions? Terry? better with the map, so we'll, we'll get the map up. But basically, I'll, I'll start on it. So PARS is a port access route study. It was initiated in 2010. 
it's still been around, um, and they've, they've had numerous community meetings on this. There's a lot of disagreements on where exactly the route should be, but basically what it creates is a voluntary route structure. It's not mandatory. The idea behind a, mounted, or a voluntary route structure, though, is that eventually it becomes sort of de facto mandatory because insurers are going to look at it and they're going to say, why didn't you follow the U.S. Coast Guard recommended? And once you, and you need to have a good answer for that, otherwise your insurance rates are going to go up if you have an accident, obviously. Um, so what this does, and this has been done only on the U.S. side, um, we, we've heard in our interviews, we've, we've heard some conversations about different views on this on both sides of the border. Um, bottom line is, is and I, I think some of it may be a communications problem. Um, a lot of people think that the route is mandatory for everybody. It's not. It's voluntary. Um, and there's another piece of it that I think uh, one, of the, one of the comments we heard in Alaska from one of the industry professionals is we're tired of boxes being drawn on maps and having to stay out of areas permanently um, and or do certain things by the, with the federal government drawing these lines. Um, and I think there's a lot of that from what we heard from the Alaska uh, stakeholders is they're not interested in having a set of lines that they have to follow additional rules that are imposed by them by the lower 48. The difference with areas to be avoided, which is our recommendation, if you can go to that slide. Mm -hmm. Areas to be avoided are basically telling you what you can't do, but they give you much greater freedom. And it's, it's a matter of semantics, uh, particularly with an academic crowd. But you can look up here, there's an orange box, and basically that's a speed restriction that covers the entire Bering Strait. It'll only be there during the time frame that it needs to be there. So let's say the whale migration lasts until 20 May at 2300 Zulu which is Greenwich Mean Time. Once that, once that time passes, you can go as fast as you want, it's, you know, or whatever the IMO says your, your speed limits are for, for a mariner. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm an aviator, so. <laughs> the next part is, is you have indigenous whaling um, in, in the purple, little tri teeny triangle from 13 to 15 May. They can be anywhere in that triangle, and all that means is you have to avoid that triangle. So you have a lot greater freedom. You're not stuck to a route. And then the last triangle, you have a red triangle, and you can use that for oil exploration operations. So industry could use ATBAs as well. But once again, it's a set time frame that it's blocked off. It's not a permanent thing on a map. And there was a lot of, uh, a lot of the Alaskans, and, and I think the Russians as well, found this a lot more attractive because you're not permanently closing areas. And, and it requires maritime domain awareness, which is a big deal for both the Russians and the U.S., because that means you're aware of what's going on in your maritime domain. That means you have an idea what boats are there, what's going on, who's moving, who's doing what. And that also gives you greater security. And security is, is a concern for both the U.S. and Russia. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Tuba? Uh, what resources are available for the Coast Guard in terms of state and local assets that could, that could help this? Oh, please. Um, so, uh, Alaska has what's called the Alaska Rescue Coordination Center, which is a place where the Coast Guard, the Alaska State Police, uh, the, the uh, Air National Guard, the Army National Guard, Civil Air Patrol, uh, and other additional resources uh, have coordinate efforts to go ahead and do search and rescue uh, uh, operations. So basically what happens is um, in Barrow, the municipality up there, for example, the north, in the North Slope, which is uh, very far from where all the Coast Guard stations are, they operate two helicopters out of there. The Alaska State Police have 40 helicopters that they have stationed throughout the state. And the Air National Guard has two air refuelable, uh, they're called Pave Hawks, which are uh, refitted Blackhawks that are available for long range rescues because they're air refuelable, so they can get out a little further than uh, other helicopters. Any other questions? I just had a quick question. Um, congratulations to you. It was really a, a great uh, project. And uh, one of the things that I found really interesting was the ability for you all to have access and have conversations with Russian government officials that in the United States government would probably not likely happen. Um, and so my question, I guess, has to do with the part of your presentation focusing on that, the difference in terms of governmental structures, our government tip, obviously, different than theirs. Um, you noted those differences. You also noted in one of your findings that what we ought to do is be talking to the right people in the Russian government. Um, I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit more about what you mean by that. 
Yeah, can you pull up the, uh, yep. the Russian hierarchy? <laughs> it's not on it. It's a lot. <laughs> we have a lot of backup slides. Okay. Thanks, Kevin, for asking that, by the way. So the key finding that we found from every single one of the 15 Russian interviewees is that all of them said that it's great that you want to talk to the Russian Coast Guard and the Maritime Rescue Service and Ministry of Natural Resources, but they said that any regulatory action in the Bering Strait or in the Arctic as far as maritime regulation goes, is going to go through the Ministry of Transportation. So the Ministry of Transportation is the key. They also noted that we in the U.S. have a much greater initiative for lower level officials to take the initiative and start projects. For instance, District 17 kind of has lead for the Port Access Route Study, which is the Coast Guard District responsible for Alaska. And there's, I think, a Coast Guard lieutenant and maybe a commander that are in charge of the, the project um, at District 17. On the Russian side, when a commander or a lieutenant calls to the Russian side to their counterpart, a commander or lieutenant, they're not going to get a lot of traction. Um, everything is much more top-down in the Russian system. And, th and this was noted by the officials, and it was also noted by the academics on the Russian side. Um, they said the best way if we want to get movement in the Bering Strait region or in the Arctic for agreements, um, the best way to do so is going to be high level. So minister to minister, so Department of State, you know, Secretary Kerry to Foreign Minister Lavrov, President to President, or similar like four-star to four-star level, high, high level contacts, and then being pushed down on the Russian side. And then those lower level contacts can go to work. But the lower level people on the Russian side are, are going to want some political cover for what they're doing, which I think is understandable, so. Mm -hmm. I noticed on your slide there that the, um, in the Russian government, the Coast Guard is actually under security. So like our Coast Guard does search and rescue, so we wouldn't necessarily call their Coast Guard because their Coast Guard doesn't do the same thing. Right, the Coast Guard is much more focused on the border control aspect, and that, that is a key, so we, Despite the name similar similarities, we, we don't do the same things. And um, it's, it's interesting because one of the U.S. senators noted that, boy, the Russians really have the bureaucracy nailed when we led through the 15 agencies that had responsibilities that the U.S. Co covers. But if you put up, a, put up the other slide, just real quick. Yeah. If you put up the other slide. The slide. <laughs> <laughs> if, you look at, if you look at the left side of this slide, the blue hierarchy is, is all the U.S. agencies that have a responsibility in the Arctic as well. So we also have the bureaucracy nailed. Yeah. It's just in a different format. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Terry. Go um, ahead. <laughs> no, but you've really done a great job, and uh, I want to see all the slides now. Um, <laughs> can I? So you really have focused on bilateral um, uh, interaction, and what I did wonder was. To the, the extent to which the rest of the world matters, and I, in, in terms of the Strait in particular, not the, sea, the Bering Sea, but like this, the Strait. And I wondered, um, you know, to what extent <coughs> that that, you know, is that an issue? Uh, maybe not. I don't know. This is the perfect slide for that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so anything that happens in the Strait because of UNCLOS, it's an international strait. So as an international strait, even if the U.S. and Russia agree to implement some sort of regulatory structure for the Bering Strait, it's going to have to go back to the International Maritime Organization under the U.N., which is up there in the top left. So ultimately, any regulations that are going to be agreed upon have to be then brought to the IMO and then approved. So unless they're voluntary. Now, bilateral voluntary regulations are going to have almost a de facto impact of regulatory or, or regulations that are implemented by the IMO because of the way insurance coverage works. So it, yeah. it's one of those pieces, but there's definitely international interest in the region. Yeah, and then and to, to include the, the Arctic Council, which you have the Arctic Eight, or you know, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, the United States, Russia, Canada. So you have all of these Arctic nations that are concerned. And then increasingly, it's the, the globalization, especially with regard to the Bering Strait, you have countries such as Singapore and India and the United Kingdom Everybody's looking to use or to, to perhaps 
extract from um, the resources uh, or the uh, the shipping and transit opportunities that are provided through the through the Arctic. So, um, a, a big concern for um, the Russians in particular is the presence of China up in the Bering Strait because they are increasingly using it for its 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 transit uh, ability. Um, however, they are uh, not as well versed with the Arctic as perhaps Russia is. So the Russians are very concerned about um, what they do and how they do it. And additionally, I think it's safe based on our study to predict that as the ice recedes and there is more access, there will be more interest from other nations as well. So while there's some interest now, you can see that, uh, as we said in 2050, if there's no ice in the summer, what will the interest look like then? Uh, and you have two clients. What do you recommend in terms of other clients? Well, WWF's role in this was primarily to hook us in to the Russian side of this. And what WWF will get out of this is the report that will help support resuming that bilateral contact. Um, one of the key instance, instances that's kind of interesting is there was a Canadian barge um, that let loose, I think in 2015, maybe it was 2014, don't, don't quote me on the dates, but it let loose in the Canadian Arctic. It then drifted across the American Arctic, north of Alaska, and then it drifted into Russian waters. The Canadian and American interaction was quite good. It worked well. The Canadians and Americans have a very close relationship. We have exchange officers. We're able to talk to each other, and we were able to track the barge. Once the barge left American waters, WWF actually, act, actually acted as an intermediary between the US and Canadian Coast Guards and the Russians, which is not ideal for communications. But that's what happened. So. One of the things that WWF is hoping to get out of this is that they won't be in the position to act as an intermediary between the U.S. and Russia, that maybe the U.S. and Russia and Canadians can all talk and jointly manage the Arctic, which we all own. And additionally, WWF, I think you're implying, well, where's the, where's the wildlife sort of piece in this? But with any of these recommendations, the wildlife, the indigenous people will be able to go on with their ways of life and... Uh, we don't have it up anymore, but ATBAs could protect, could protect any migration patterns, and that is obviously a major concern of the WWF um, right, and part of the reason. Absolutely. They've already been. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. They're absolutely, absolutely yeah. helpful. Um, they have a bigger role than people might think. Yeah. <laughs> they, they play a, a, a surprisingly critical role, um, and they have surprisingly um, high-level access. Um, yeah. one, one of the guys that we were, were speaking with in WWF um, was just, just amazing at, at the people that he had talked to recently. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, congratulations, and I, I hope uh, that this isn't the only group that you briefed on this, because this, this really should be of great interest to, in Washington. You've already made contacts there. so. I hope your final product gets to the National Security Council or someone uh, with responsibility for this. I just want to make one point where you might be able to get their attention by linking a few things. You talked about decoupling. Uh, it seems to me that the analogy of decoupling with respect to outer space is a little easier than decoupling here, and primarily because of what's happening in the North Atlantic with NATO and the tensions that are going on with ships being buzzed by uh, Russian planes and the like. On the other hand, if you can get an agreement to decouple with respect to the Bering Strait, you could create some precedents that could help with respect to the easing tensions on the other side of the, of the world uh, where the NATO uh, and Russian forces are, you know, banging heads. So that may be a pitch to make. You know, let's try for something that's a little more benign, a little more in the interest of both countries, and maybe we can work something there that would help us in the other part of the world. Just a suggest suggestion. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Anyone else, too? <laughs> Gary. Um, so I have to bring up some economics here. And that is, I'm just thinking about, um, and, and just actually something you could explain at this point. Um, so you've got this area, right? And, um, and your description of the Canadian ship, I think, was really uh, 
helpful for me under, to understand something. But I think about this in a way it's a game, right? And you know, you've got these two players, you've got Russia, you've got the United States, and to some extent it's a matter of there's you know clearly a lot to be gained from collaboration from what, as you've described. Um, but is, how much of this from the economics uh, from an economic perspective is, well, if we don't take care of it, they will. Like another, it, it, because the because the consequences of a major spill up there, you know, um, like you mentioned at the beginning, I thought your beginning was excellent. The way that you presented the mil the, the value of the mineral deposits. I mean, 40, 50 years ago, we didn't even know how to use a lot of those minerals, right? Um, so, I, you know, I'm thinking about just the economic value uh, and the, our greater appreciation for the environment, and so so on either side, you know, I mean, from a, a world perspective consequences of, of a catastrophe are enormous and do we really just you know are we going to hold them up well if we don't do it together it won't happen you know so there's a couple of interesting pieces on on the economics there I don't think that we're waiting for the Russians to respond and I don't think they're waiting for us to respond um, the, the reality is is it's a big world and the Arctic's one of the many focuses that the US has from the people that we've spoken to on the US side and the same is the reality for the Russians. The Russians um, have limited resources. It's tough times with the decline in oil prices. And the, all the Russian officials made it very clear that there's not a lot of extra resources to go around. And they're focused on their Western Arctic because the Western Arctic is where right now the most traffic in business is. And it's also where their LNG sites are. Um, that being said, I think the argument that could be made for the, at least the three steps that we had for the initial risk reduction package that we've, we've created that we think should be discussed in June is that those steps are relatively cheap. And given the low cost of those three steps, we believe that those, that's a good starting point. And, and the cooperation makes it cheaper. You know, that, that, that's the whole idea is that one side doesn't bear all the cost. Um, and, and the two sides, there's efficiencies to be gained by, by working together in the area. I think you had. Yeah, and, and it, it's also, it's yes, an extraction to get that, that immediate benefit, but it's also very much focused on risk as well. So even if there were to be an accident, uh, an oil spill, for instance, on the Russian side, the currents that are currently up in the Bering Strait would go to the American side anyway, making it a, a, a dual uh, concern for both. So that's just it's something that the we have to address in order to work cooperatively, not just for extraction and, and transit, but for prevention. Mm -hmm. And when we spoke to one of the U.S. Senators um, in Washington last month, I think last month, uh, we talked to their staff, and, and three of their staffers sat down with us, and like they said, every one of these steps eventually is going to be needed in the Arctic. The, you know, and the key, like the U.S. Navy strategy actually marks, is to time those infrastructure improvements with when they're needed. And that's, that's going to be one of the key. But w one of the easiest ways to start is with some of the easy steps, like start cooperating, resuming exercises, talking. Th those are relatively cheap actions. Figure out, get your phone book correct so I know who to call during a disaster. And, and I know the other person's going to pick up, and I know what their capabilities are. Th those are all relatively cheap actions that really do reduce risk. An interviewer said that we need a bat phone. We need somebody to call. <laughs> Any other questions? Bill? Um, a significant accomplishment, so congratulations. This has just been fabulous. I'd ask you to take a minute and step back and offer your reflections on the experience itself over the last year. What are some of your takeaways from this? Uh, I don't mind beginning. Sure. Uh, something that I thought about saying for the last question, but maybe it fits a little better here, is just um, over all of our research, especially when we were in Alaska, I, I came to realize that there is a lack of interest, and that is one of the main problems, is that Alaska, the Bering Strait, Russia, the Arctic, it's all sort of taking the back burner to a lot of other international issues. Um, and one of our interviewees actually referred to Alaska as um, a backwater snow globe. Uh, that's how the lower 48 thinks of it. And while it seems like a funny joke, at the same time, it's, it's not funny because if something happened, 
uh, it's no longer just a backwater snow globe. So I think something that I really took away is that this needs to be actually really put forward in the media as not just something where container shipping can go through, but as something that's actually really important to the, to the world and is actually an international issue and not just an international issue that some people mention when they're talking about economics or when they're talking about um, a disaster or something like that. So that's been something I've really taken out of this is that the Arctic, the Bering Strait, it's, it's vital. So. I agree. Uh, you know, Pat, you asked about uh, the cost of not acting and, you know, the economics of it. And, you know, I simply think the just not acting at all, if a disaster occurs, the cost that's going to it's going to create to fix the problem is going to be far more and last a lot longer than if we just put some very modest um, mitigating pieces in place now. So I, I think that, again, the lack of action is really the, the major takeaway. And I like to think of as the cost that, w that would, uh, not, not only monetary cost, but, uh, but other costs associated with it, some sort of catastrophic disaster would just be insane. And, um, and I'd first take this opportunity to say that I've had an incredible experience working with this team. Um, they're amazing. Uh, and also just to meet and to, to have conversations with people from the Coast Guard and people from Russia. And a lot of these people, a lot of people interested in the Arctic have not had that sort of opportunity. So in order to, to kind of be that person to perhaps give that other opinion or that perspective has been um, so incredibly re rewarding and I've had just, a, just an incredible time too and to have my eyes open at the complexity of this issue as well. We did our best to talk about the stakeholders, about the security concerns and about um, political tensions and about other matters that are perhaps nowhere even close to the Arctic um, and how that impacts Arctic policy making. So it's, it's a fascinating world to get into and um, Arctic policy is, is, is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard to follow all that, but uh, <laughs> it, it was truly, um, for, for those that know me, I've, I was in the Army and, and now I'm in the Coast Guard getting ready to go teach at the Coast Guard Academy, and I, I would say that this, this capstone experience is probably one of the highlights uh, of my military career. Um, it has been absolutely incredible. Um, Alaska, the people that we spoke to, the places that we traveled to, dog sledding in Alaska. <laughs> um, just absolutely incredible. Um, and then going to Russia and spending time with the Russians in both Moscow and St. Petersburg and getting to know them and what a fantastic and welcoming people that they were. And really the, the way that they shared information with us was just incredible. I mean, a much better reception than I expected um, and truly very, very friendly. And they provided probably more feedback um, than our Russian interviewees did, believe it or not, on the paper, on the final report. So those of you that have the final report, or if you want it, please let us know and we'll email it to you. Um, but there is a lot of Russian voice in, in the report. And uh, it was super, super appreciated because it, it wasn't expected and we, we killed ourselves to get the report done in time with the draft and then to get it translated and sent to Russia and we gave them <laughs> all of five days to respond and they took the time to respond. So just just how open and kind uh, I think everyone was that we spoke to and how helpful everyone was, in particular working with Becca and working with Elena was absolutely amazing. So I think we got very, very lucky and had probably, if not the best, one of the best clients um, yeah, of, of all the groups. So. Absolutely. So on that note, um, 